Welcome to Worship with Midland Online. Here this fourth Sunday in the season of Lent leading up to Easter, these times of preparation, these times of self-reflection, and really readying ourselves for the day of big celebration, the very reason we meet every other time as a church. And so, so glad you're able to join us online this week. We're moving our way through the Gospel of John, looking at this last day in the life of Jesus before he is crucified and all the things he had to say in the Gospel of John, and also offering opportunities for you to worship online and for your kids to worship. So if you got kids in the house and you want them to have something good to do and you're not sure if this is going to be the kind of engagement they need, check out the link right here in the video. Go pull it up on another TV, another device in your house, and give your kids a chance to worship right now um, as you get this chance. Or if you want to and you want to save it for later, uh, get your kids together and you as a family sit down, watch it together, and have an opportunity to talk about God as you can learn together about how much God truly does love us. I'm so glad you're with us. Take a look also in the description for a place to fill out the connection card this morning. It's just one of the ways we stay connected here at Midland. Let us know you're worshiping with us online. If you have any prayer requests or anything you want to be in prayer about, let us know right there on that link. You'll also find an opportunity to give online here at Midland. We're so grateful for the generosity that makes possible the ministry we do here. So click on that link, uh, fill out your card, and take an opportunity to give online right there on our website. You can do Clover Give, or you can even text to give. It has both of those options available. So check that out. So glad you're able to join with us as we worship together here in this season of Lent. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy God, we come before you acknowledging ourselves as your people, your very creation, the God who's created all things, including us, and is working in the midst of all things to draw us together and to help us live into life to the fullest, and we are so grateful for that. God, during this season, we take 40 days of special times of reflection, of looking at what has been, examining our lives, God, spending time, God, giving up or taking on to make these days different than the typical days of the year. May we be reminded of the work you are doing, God, this work that you have done and this call that you have placed on the life of all those who are part of your church to live into such a way to see your kingdom come. God, we lift up to you all the prayer requests here today. Those who are going through tough times, those who stand in need, those who feel forgotten. 
God, those who have stepped out on faith and yet are still wondering, God, may you give us assurance that you are with us. May you so fill us with your spirit that we live as the body of Christ here in this world, making your name and renown known to all those who encounter us. It's as your people that we continue to join together in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, for this week, I want to focus in this series looking at the one day, the last day of Jesus' life before he is crucified and these teachings that he has to kind of focus it in on those people who maybe you consider yourself a part of the church, a person of faith that's a follower of Jesus, and really ask a question this week that focuses in on people of the church. Because as we look at all the different questions that can arise as we read through the Bible, and oftentimes the eager desire we have to answer all the questions that we ever have, this series is all based around willing, being willing to accept the fact that there's questions to be asked. And sometimes as we search for the answer, it takes us on the very journey that draws us closer to God, whether or not we're able to get a confirmed answer or not. Because, hey, at the end of the day, we're not about trying to prove everything in the world because proving is knowledge. And knowledge is great. And yet we understand very well that what we're all about in the church as people of faith, right? Not be able to prove it all and to know it all, but to have faith even in the midst of it all. And so we're asking the questions throughout this series, really, instead of trying to find answers to everything, to see if it can guide us on the journey to maybe experience in new ways who God truly is revealed through His Son, Jesus, in His death, in His life, in His resurrection. And so, you know, as we get started talking about it, and have you ever had those moments, uh, you're kind of reading through the Bible, and, and as you read a passage of Scripture that you've read before, or you've heard somebody talk about before, or maybe it's your favorite one, and so you read it regularly, but on this day, this morning, this night, as you're reading it, somehow it just sounds different to you. Have you ever been there? You notice a word that you have never noticed before, and you think, has this always been in here? Or did, I, did I pick up a different Bible? Like, whose is this? Am I in the same? Is this John, or is this First John? You ever been there before? And it seems like you're reading something that's totally fresh and totally new. And it's in some way the same words probably that you've been reading for however long you've been reading the Bible, right? But now it seems to be speaking to something that's been going on in your life in a way that you've never really thought about those exact same words on a page. You ever been there before? If you have, it's pretty amazing. If you have not, keep trying and reading the Bible because the time comes and it's not just the Bible this happens. And even though I think there's something very amazing that happens as we read through scripture for the very reason we're going to talk about today, but I believe it can happen in lots of areas that we find ourselves in a different place of life and looking at the same situation. And in this case, reading the same words begins to speak in a different way. And the question is, why is that, right? Why does that really happen? I'm sure there's lots of reasons out there that people could give and maybe several that come to your mind. But something I love about the Gospel of John, especially during this season of Lent, is we're focusing on those last hours of Jesus's life that leads up to his crucifixion. I love what John says to help us understand maybe what's really going on in those moments when we see the same words as we're reading through the Bible, and yet they seem to be speaking to us in a completely new way. If you got your Bible, we're going to be in John chapter 16. You're welcome to kind of follow along here this week. And as we're going over it, there's this problem that kind of arises that's going on at the church during this time. And that's the fact that, you know, as Jesus has come and lived this life, taught all these amazing things, demonstrated this amazing love and great power that God has to bring fullness of life, even in the midst of the tough times, was crucified and then did the most amazing thing, which was beat death and come back that shows that in the end, death doesn't win. That's now been a pretty long time, uh, for these people at least, as the Gospel of John is written. Most of the people who were around when Jesus lived and when Jesus rose from the dead and came back and spoke to the disciples, most of those people have died now. This is written sometime maybe around 60 to 65 years after the resurrection of Jesus. So a lot of people have passed away that were there in the moment to see it. 
In fact, some people are really bothered by that because they felt like the teachings of Jesus, as we find in Paul and the other Gospels, in fact, that Jesus was saying, hey, before you die, I'm coming back to bring this whole new life back to the world. And yet it didn't happen exactly how they expected it to happen. And so this uh, kind of time arose where not only are they experiencing all this uh, force from the outside coming in on them and pressing on them and making their lives so tough, but even within their own camps, they're fighting and they're wondering. They're wondering, was Jesus really onto something here? Was he really the Son of God come here to bring this idea and this reality now of this new life that can be taken, a new heaven and a new earth? Or did we kind of miss something here? Because it seems to be stretching a lot longer than we expected. And now here we sit, you know, a couple thousand years later, and many of us ask the same question question. In fact, we begin to try to predict the future and the end of the world, do we not? This comes up regularly. Oh, end times are on us because COVID-19 arrived. I'm sure you've heard it and some of us are probably siding with that. I'm not quite sure that's the case whatsoever, but I know that people face this and it's not new. It's something that people have been going through for a very long time. And so this writing that we read in the Gospel of John, as we talked about in the very first week of this series, is emerging in the midst of these times when it's been several, several decades now since the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and people are experiencing forces from the outside pressing in on them because of their faith. There's arguments amongst the people who are followers of Jesus in regards to their faith. And you got people going, is there anything new to come? Is God still at work? Was that in Jesus's life? And now we just got to hope that end comes for the kingdom of God coming to earth sooner than later. And the author begins to write. And as John is writing here for us to read so much longer, begins to address this very problem they were having. And according to John, the solution to this time of wondering was Jesus' whole work really going to play out the way we expected it to? Or are we now left alone on our own to fend for ourselves as we wait for his return? begins to pull out from other things that have been written before the Gospel of John that you can read in other parts of the Bible and really focus on an understanding of God present with us after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's probably something that you've thought about and heard talked about before, and that is the paraclete, the advocate, the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit. All these words that come together to describe this understanding of God's continued presence with us through the Holy Spirit still today. And there's some actually denominations within the church, and this is the big focus for them, is the work of the Holy Spirit still today. And there's other denominations within the church that seem to forget that and ne neglect it and forget that God is still working in us through the Holy Spirit and so I want to take a look at that today and see how John really portrays this idea in the midst of the toughest times as people are wondering, how is God really working and is God really working around here? This idea of God's presence with us still today through the Holy Spirit, this link between the historical ministry of Jesus and the future life of the church still today and still to come. There's five references now to the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John. And it takes place here in this farewell address, what we've been reading through this last uh, day of Jesus's life. And so you can actually read through some other parts where Jesus has already referenced the Holy Spirit from the text we're going to read in chapter 16 today. But I really want to kind of set up this idea of how the role of the Holy Spirit is really accented in the Gospel of John. Now, this is not saying this is the only way the Holy Spirit is working, but I want to really look at how John focuses it on, this working of the Holy Spirit in the midst of the church during this time going through tremendous crisis from forces from the outside and within them and huge doubt arising within the church of how John begins to address this in the gospel of John. In chapter 14, verse 26, there's this verse that kind of lays out and helps us understand the Holy Spirit to set us up for this chapter 16 text today. And it reads like this, chapter 14, verse 26, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. And so this is it, this understanding of 
this advocate, the Holy Spirit, the one who will speak on your behalf. This is a word that literally comes from the legal system during this time. So this is like talking about a defense lawyer would be a good way to understand this advocate, one who speaks on behalf of those under trial. Now, we also find here that the Holy Spirit takes on this role of prosecutor in our text today. But you have to understand there's this advocate, this understanding of the Holy Spirit as the advocate, that word used to define someone who speaks on our behalf and in our defense as people of faith. And this, this advocate, the Holy Spirit, will teach you all things. So there's more things still for us to learn and will remind you of everything I've already said. And this is what Jesus says. I've already said things. And so the Holy Spirit has these two roles that are really interrelated and defined here in the Gospel of John for us that show up each time the Holy Spirit is mentioned these five times in the last few chapters here. There's this idea of the sustaining nature of the Holy Spirit. The the paraclete's role is sustaining the church to remind the church to remember to remind the church to remember all that Jesus has said and all that Jesus has done in the hardest times and in the darkest days of going, remember what has already been done. And that should bring comfort for us in those tough times to teach us, to remind us as the church what Jesus himself had done. Now, it doesn't stop there because there's also this idea of to teach you all things. And this is what I want to look at today is what does it mean when we had this idea of the Holy Spirit to teach us all things. So, get your Bible. John chapter 16 is where we're at today, beginning right here in verse 1, to really set up these first few verses to set up this idea of the Holy Spirit, not just sustaining, but also teaching, or as I want to kind of look at it here this week, revealing. Sustaining and the revealing nature of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verse 1 This is some tough news to get started here. This kind of update on the condition of the disciples is going to become apparent. They've been together now for quite some time. Jesus has been speaking to them. And he starts like this. He says, All this I have told you so that you will not fall away, so that you can remain faithful. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They're going to kill you in the name of God, the very one we came here to serve, my Father in heaven, as Jesus has been referring to God throughout this time. The God, Yahweh, who has sent me, I am his son, God incarnate, and yet they will be killing you in the name of the very one who sent me. We saw it. The people reading this at this time go, amen. That is the absolute truth, right? They will kill you because they think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. And the real deal is they've missed it completely. They just completely miss God revealing God's self to them through Jesus. Verse 4, I have told you this so that When their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. So I'm I'm predicting it. I'm telling it again. If this is being read around the year 95, as all this that Jesus is talking about has been taking place in the lives of these people reading it as this writing is taking place, they're looking back and going, Jesus was right on. He knew exactly how it was going to go. And this speaks very strongly to them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. But now that I am going to him who sent me, none of you ask me, where are you going? And Jesus goes, look, as long as I'm with you, I've been able to protect you and it's been just fine. But as I go away, it's only going to get worse. And again, the people sitting there several decades later go, exactly, it did. And it was really tough when Jesus was alive. We've already read some crazy stories and you can read them in the Bible, things that happened right during Jesus' life. And then you can read writings from Paul and other people of, It got really tough in those first years and decades afterwards. And here we are now, maybe as much as what, four, five, six decades after Jesus's death and resurrection. And they're saying, yeah, and it's only getting tougher for us. None of you ask me, where are you going? To which when I read that, I go, oh, no, they did though. They did. And you're probably thinking the same thing if you've been following along through this series, because back in chapter 13, where we got this whole thing started, that's the very question that Peter asked. Is it not? He said, hey, Jesus, where are you going? 
but I wonder if this is not in reference. That could be a couple of things. Some people would argue that there's some what we call redaction. In other words, these stories of Jesus that have been going around in the Johannine culture, the people to which this gospel was originally written, these ideas and these stories of Jesus that have been around for, for just, as we said, decades being told and told again, they're brought together. And they're not always as easily formatted together because in, you know it ended there in chapter 14 of saying, let us go. And then in chapter 15, it doesn't look like they went anywhere, right? So we're going, okay, did they start walking? Did they go somewhere? We don't really know. And so was this a story that was put in there? They wasn't really thinking about the fact that Peter had asked that question in chapter 13 of the final compilation, which you can argue that. That's that kind of historical literary criticism. But here for us, just theologically speaking, I think it's very good to say that as this story has been going on and Jesus has been teaching for some time, you got a group of guys that Jesus says is in the present tense, asks, as in now you don't ask, where are you going? And maybe the reason they're not asking that question anymore, but they did at the beginning, is they're absolutely overwhelmed. Because here's the very next verse that we read. Verse 6, rather, you are filled with grief because I've said these things. You don't ask where I'm going anymore, do you? You're too overwhelmed by the grief that comes as I tell you how it's going down that there's going to be really tough days. And that could be so true for us today. That we're in it, we're going to figure it out, we're going to problem solve, we're going to get it all right. And then at some point it gets to that point where we're going, gosh, can we do anything about this? Is there anything that can be done? And Jesus says, he references right here, no, you are now overwhelmed by what I've told you. And then he begins to add to this, to uplift the spirits a little bit. And here's how it goes. Here comes this idea of the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John. Verse 7, But very truly I tell you, it's for your good that I'm going away. But there's a payoff here. Yeah, I'm going to be gone, and there's going to be a lot of bad stuff coming your way as I'm gone. The people out there are going to be pushing in hard on you. Again, the people who are reading this are going, absolutely. People in our world still today read this and go, absolutely. But very truly I tell you, it's for your good. There's a payoff here that I am going away, even though there'll be more pressure on you. And here it is. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. As I go, the Holy Spirit, the one who will speak, the one who will work on your behalf, the one who will speak for you, as we read in other parts, even when you do not have words to say, that is when advocate, the Holy Spirit will hold up, will show up. As I go, the Holy Spirit comes to be working in your life. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world. Now, you got to remember in the gospel of John, the world is anything that is not the kingdom of God. And so this is the sinfulness, the brokenness, all the bad stuff going on. In the gospel of John, that is often referred to as the world. For God so loved the world, the brokenness, all the sin, the, the bad stuff of the world. God so loved that he sent his one and only son. And here again, this idea of world shows up. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about these three things, about sin, righteousness, and judgment. And here again, we had this idea, this the paraclete, this advocate speaking on behalf, really becoming somewhat of a prosecutor here. It's going to call out the world. The Holy Spirit will call out the world to be wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. And what all does that really mean? Well, here you go. John's going to break it down for us. Wrong about sin here in verse 9, because people do not believe in me, is the here's a big deal for the Gospel of John. We often talk about sin being these uh, like times that you break some rule, this moral code that you've deviated from, and that's a sin, and you have sinned now because you are a sinner. But for the Gospel of John, though that shows up in other places in the Bible, and that can, that's very true for the Gospel of John. That's not how the Gospel of John uses this idea of sin. For John, sin is not the, all the actions and bad things. Sin is a lack of faith. It's not being a believer. That's what sin is. The world's sin is to not believe the continual rejection of Jesus as God incarnate. That's how it is in the Gospel of John. So this idea that prove them wrong when it comes to their sin because people don't believe in me. And they're going to prove that, you know what, there's good reason to believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Verse 10, wrong about righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me 
no longer. And again, righteousness now is this term that's really used in the legal sense of, of what is right and what is just. And the world is on trial here by the paraclete, by the Holy Spirit, and they don't win and get it right on their own. And they don't win and get it right. They're not righteous on their own. They don't get it right in convicting Jesus, of killing Jesus, of persecuting the church. They don't get it right and achieve righteousness on their own. In fact, Jesus says, here's the deal. When they come and arrest me and then crucify me on the cross, it's not them winning. It's me choosing to do that. And this is a big deal. Wrong in their righteousness. In verse 11, and about judgment, wrong when it comes to their judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. The ultimate judgment is the judgment of the ruler of the world, which again, what's the world? It's all the bad, all the evil. This is the judgment that comes place. The embodiment of all that is opposed to God is defeated and God wins. And this is quite a teaching that he has right now of what the Holy Spirit will be doing, working as the prosecutor, it seems, here. And there's a shift that takes place after verse 11 as we pick up here in verse 12. The paraclete, the advocate, the comforter, the helper, now takes on this role, not of what the paraclete and the Holy Spirit will do in the world, in the brokenness, but what the Holy Spirit will do in the church, the gathering of believers. Verse 12. I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear now. In other words, Jesus is saying, I've got more things to teach you, more things to share with you, but if I do it now, you can't hear them. There's no way you're at a place to be able to hear what I have to say, understand it, and see it in your life. But when He, the, whole, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. And here comes this idea of the future, what is to come, even after Jesus is resurrected and goes to be with the Father and the Advocate and the Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all the truth, which is a very comforting time here for them. One, you're not going to be alone. God is present with you through the Spirit working in your life, guiding you into the truth. And second, the Holy Spirit is here to teach you all that you can't hear and understand right now. There's more still to learn from you than what I can teach you at this point. He will not speak on his own. He'll speak only what he hears. And the Holy Spirit will tell you what is yet to come. And this is great. This is the later on, the guide for all that is to come our way, revealing the teachings of Jesus to them in the midst of the new and changing environments they find themselves in. Verse 14, He, the Holy Spirit, will, will glorify me because it is from me that He will receive what He will make known to you. And so this is this big idea that the Holy Spirit is the one speaking still the words that Jesus is revealing to the Holy Spirit to speak. So this idea of God, the three in one, as we will find in this text big several times, this reference of the Holy Spirit, Jesus and God all right there together. And this is where we get this idea of the Trinity from. Or in text just like what we're reading today. And Jesus is saying, I'm speaking through as you hear the Holy Spirit speaking to your life. That's me speaking to your life. Verse 15, all that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. And there's that idea of the Trinity. The Spirit, Father, God, and Jesus all right there together. And the crazy thing about that part right there is all in the future tense. The Holy Spirit continues to move. The Holy Spirit continues to make known all that Jesus has for us to know as the world continues to change. Have you ever thought about that when you're reading through the Bible here? Not me. You know, as I've talked with people and people kind of say, hey, there's ways to understand the Bible. These are words that were spoken and written a long time ago. You understand them in the context of which they're written, and then you apply them to your life because this is how it went. And so if the Bible says this, and that's what we do, which like in 1 Corinthians, you're going to read over there, it says like women should be quiet in worship, and they should sit on the opposite side of the church from the men. And we should keep doing that. And that's what some churches do. Other churches say, no, no, you're missing it. Yes, you can understand it in the context, and you bring it into this context of today, this lesson that is learned. But it's not because it's exactly this that has to be done again, that we have to keep women on one side and men on the other. And women need to be really quiet. It's more of a trajectory of what he's teaching here. Orderly worship matters, and we need to set aside a special time 
where we come with the purpose to encounter God and not to be distracted by all the things that can distract us. And there's a lesson learned that now is seen differently in our world. We don't separate women from men here at Midland, right? I'm not sure if you do that at your home. It's like, you know, you make your wife sit on the other couch, your husband has to sit in his chair and not come over here to your chair. But this is a big deal that we have, that the Holy Spirit continues to speak and to work in our lives today. And that is this idea that we talked about sustaining The staining role of the Holy Spirit reminding us of all that Jesus has taught. And now this idea of revealing, revealing to teach you all things as Jesus has said here, that the Holy Spirit continues to work and to speak to us today. Revealing enables the words of Jesus to resound afresh in ever-changing circumstances. I love that quote. The, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, enables the words of Jesus to resound afresh in ever-changing circumstances. This is that very reason why sometimes we pick up the Bible and read something we have read over and over again, and yet it just sounds different now. And you can attribute to all kinds of things. It's where I'm at in life, what I've learned, what I've been through, what I've seen, what I've experienced. And John goes, yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. It could be all those things. But I'll tell you one thing I know it is. It's the Holy Spirit continue to speak, to remind us, and to teach us still today for the word of Jesus to move forward from this moment in history when it is written to the present life of the church still today. The Holy Spirit is the very guarantee that the words of Jesus will always be available for us to speak into our lives now and into all the future still to come. It's the Holy Spirit. Which brings us kind of this question for the week, since I'm putting the questions out there. How do you see the Holy Spirit teaching and guiding the church today? As you look at it and think about it, you know, for this, it was a big understanding for John that the Holy Spirit wasn't about your personal life. It was about the Holy Spirit when you gather together. This was the understanding, the gathering of the people together. as The Holy Spirit works through the gathering of the people together. Go read it again if you want to. Not this personal thing where I'm sitting off in a corner by myself in this time of prayer and the Holy Spirit told me. I'm not against that. I'm not saying that the Bible doesn't have the other places. But for John and where we are this week, it's not going, what's the Holy Spirit telling you in your prayer closet? The question is, how do we see the Holy Spirit teaching and guiding the church? It reminds us once again of this importance of unity that John got us all started with in chapter 13. It reminds us again that we're in this together. We are not alone. In the very moment we draw lines to separate you out from me as a person of faith, that maybe we're missing it. True. So where are we being reminded? Where are we being reminded of this experience today? The work of God, what Jesus has already taught. Where are we reminded of that? And where are we seeing it all in new ways How do you see the Holy Spirit teaching and guiding the church? Let's pray. God, we we read these words, and in some ways it feels too vulnerable, and it seems to open up a box of just an absolute mess for us here, that people could in some way begin to claim that the Holy Spirit told them to do it. If there's really this idea that God, you continue to work through us, through your Spirit present in our lives. God, to teach us, to give us eyes to see in an ever-changing world. We could begin to manipulate and to assign to you things that in no way came from your Spirit working in us. And yet, God, we also have this reason for faith, this reason for comfort and assurance that even though we seem to in some ways be opening ourselves up for the complete improper use, God, of your name in our world today, that we also find comfort that it is true, that words were spoken, and those words continue to speak to us today through your Spirit in our lives. And God, we thank you for that presence with us, and we ask you to reveal yourself to us through the working of your Holy Spirit as we gather together in your name week after week and throughout the week. And during this season of Lent, as we reflect, as we go through this time of preparation, that your Spirit would move among us. And so open our eyes to live life in your name, to see your kingdom come. 
Amen. You know, I'm so glad you were able to worship with us online this week. We have the big Easter celebration coming up here. One thing we do is we offer a big Easter egg hunt each year. And last year, of course, it got canceled since we weren't able to gather together. But we're doing it again this year. So I want to make sure you're aware of it. If you want to join in on Easter Sunday, we're going to have it after the 11 o'clock service on Easter Sunday happening here at the church. Just want to get word out. Invitation to all you families, bring your kids up. It's a great time. We'll be out in the yard, which we got plenty of yard around here to have nice separation still, but a great opportunity um, to see the kids out there just enjoying it on Easter Sunday. On that Sunday, we'll also have five services happening. We're going to have a seven o'clock sunrise service going on. So all are invited out here to the church at seven o'clock in the morning outside. If it's raining and nasty, we will not be meeting at seven o'clock. You're welcome to come, but you might be by yourself standing in the rain. Uh, That service will be canceled if there's inclement weather. Um, But then we'll have 830 worship. We call it coffee house worship that takes place in the fellowship hall. We're going to have 930 traditional worship in the sanctuary here at the church. That is our traditional gathering. And then we'll have uh, 10 o'clock online worship happening just like it is this week. And then 11 o'clock outside modern worship is weather permitting again under the pavilion full band set up outside for a great time of worship on easter sunday outside if it gets rainy and nasty we will still have an 11 o'clock service it'll just be inside so go on put that on your calendar now pick a time that you want to worship five opportunities from seven in the morning to 8 30 to 9 30 to 10 o'clock right here online to 11 o'clock so you pick what's best for you and your family as we get opportunities to celebrate the resurrection all together go forth in peace the grace of the lord jesus christ the love of the father and communion with the holy spirit be with you all amen we'll see you next week